Okay, mate, 40 here. What a wonderful time to learn some Torah from Mark Shapiro here. Topic, the rise of reform and the rabbinic response, talking about the 19th century. This is talk number three. Uh, so I, I, I don't know if it's correct that they're post-Talmudic. Uh, they, they weren't accepted as having the status of a Talmud, and obviously a lot of the information in there is from the Talmudic period, and maybe some of it's later, perhaps, but uh, it, it's not necessarily uh, clear whether that's the case. Okay, I have other things to say, but I'm going to uh, hold off on this till next week. I think, uh, uh, even I'll talk about this book in the next class, then I guess some of you have it. It's in the lecture site. The man and the Hebrew, uh, about, uh, against Ramosha Feinstein. But uh, I'll get to that uh, next class. Uh, okay, let me put this away here. And, uh, one of the things I want to discuss is this idea of violating Shabbos from writing a command. Going to a tzaddik. Wait to hear what I what I have. Oh, well, one more thing I have to tell you right now. Uh, I also in the class I, I, I forgot about Alexander. Uh, I said I wasn't, wasn't talking about whether he was assassinated or attempted assassination. The reason I was confused was because in 1881, that's when he was killed. Uh, Zah. Sorry, saw, Alexander. I knew there were. I thought there was only one or two attempts on him. It turns out there were five attempts on his life before they actually killed him. So, uh, uh, any of them. Uh, I want to speak now. Let's return to what we are doing. We're talking about reform. We're going to move forward in that. At the end of last class, in the comments, someone asked about, uh, well, what about all the things that uh, reform, that Orthodox Jews do, that you can call that reforms as well. Right, every group reforms uh, just this over time. week on um, Rabbi Slifkin's uh, website, he even had a post on this. Five dangerous reforms in Orthodox Judaism. I think I would put these as reforms. Because you have to distinguish between halachic like, reforms and non halachic reforms. Although I already told you about. So this is Natan Slipkin, and I think he's inspired or encouraged by Mark Shapiro to get a PhD. So Natan Slipkin operates uh, rationalistjudaism.com. He's a uh, Kind of a centrist orthodox rabbi who's written a lot about uh, evolution and judaism so last year you might recall that uh, a reform that uh, was all over the uh hasidic world uh during COVID. the whole idea that uh, you can have weddings of a thousand people and have uh, come to show with hundreds and hundreds of people and before the vaccine and not be concerned people are dropping dead every day and now be concerned about that with pikoach nefesh of my i said that that's we are seeing an example of reform Judaism before our eyes, despite the fact that these people have long bekeshes and pay us and everything. But if uh, you feel that Pikuach Nefesh has to be pushed aside, is Pikuach Nefesh is Doha because you need to go to the Rebbe's Tish. I mean, that's a form of reform Judaism, no question about Tish is but, a uh, meal for the Rebbe. If you read his post, the example is what he thinks are reform. So, but uh, it is a good point that we do have reforms of small bars and. Uh, and that's going to be one of the issues. What's going to define a real reform, a lovely, problematic reform, versus a reform with a small r? So, for so it comes down to, do you want to remain in the community? Right? If you want to evolve out of the community, then you can make all the reforms you want. If you want to reform within the community, you have to you know, make alliances with people. You have to get on the same page with people. Right? You have to submerge your, your ego you have to build friendships, you have to listen, compromise. You have to do a lot of work if you want to reform and stay within the community. For instance, uh, depending how much longer we go in this series, we'll see the Rav Shamsham Rav Hirsch had reforms also. And other Gadolim had uh, reforms. Shamsham uh, Raphael Hirsch, founder of modern Orthodox what Judaism in Germany in the 19th century. At, uh, this work. Rashal Berlin, we'll give him the name Rav because was a rabbi, uh, but uh, Shaul Shaul Berlin was a massive forger, a massive forger in 19th century Germany. Berlin's uh, the Sami Rosh, and uh, I, I gave you the introduction, and uh, so the book was published, and here's the title, 
title page, uh, and uh, it wasn't long after the book was published, and of course everyone bought it, because uh, you have all these responses from Rishonim there. Once they start reading it, it became impossible to imagine that one of the important Rishonim, the Rush, as well as other Rishonim, could have written what appears in there. And a huge campaign was then launched against Shaul Berlin, who already was in trouble for the work he published against um, the, the Torah Shippasil of uh, Rafal of, uh, of Hamburg. Uh, so all the rabbis started going up against uh, Shaul Berlin that uh, this could not be true, this had to be a forgery. And they, I don't think they assumed that it was all forgery. They assumed he forged certain true vote. And the only one left standing for him was his um, father, the Chassam Sofer, term the book Kizve Harosh. That is not Kisve, the writings of the Rush, but the falsehoods of the Rush. Ramordechai Bennett of Nicholsburg. He he's sort of forgotten today among most people because uh, the Hassan Sofer's the Hassan Sofer who looked up to him, but the Hassan Sofer um, then overshadows him. If you come with me to Central Europe, we'll see his kever. Uh, he wrote a sefer called the Parashas Mordechai. He really was a, a, a giant. Uh, uh, he also leads the attack against the Shaul Berlin. Today, all academic scholars recognize this work is a forgery. In fact, it's impossible to read the Bissam and Rosh in isolation from everything else we know about Shaul Berlin. How he, he leaves the rabbinate, he comes to Berlin, he uh, falls in with this Haskalah group. Uh, Haskalah is the Jewish and, Enlightenment. Uh, you have to understand it this way. But not all posts can recognize this. Besami Rosh continues to be quoted as an authoritative halachic work by Poskim who either are completely unaware of the history. So just because you're a rabbi doesn't mean that you can recognize a forgery. Uh, just because you're a rabbi doesn't mean that you're more righteous or less righteous than any other profession. Doesn't mean you're more or less honest, that you're more or less nice, you're more or less ethical. All right? So rabbis, you can can expect, depending on their education, they may have considerable knowledge in a certain area. Doesn't mean that they have knowledge outside that area, right? They are like uh, any other class of intellectuals who, once they get outside their field of expertise, right, they can say smart or stupid things. And when I say unaware, that means they don't read Achronis, they don't know Mordechai ben so the acronym talking about rabbinic sages about the 13th, 14th, 15th century, the Rishonim, 11th and 12th century, great rabbis. Or they know, but they don't accept it. And as I showed you, a new edition of the Besamian Rosh was published in 1984. Here's uh, my copy of it, and I, I showed you last class the link that you can all uh, buy uh, this Besamian Rosh if you... Uh, if you choose to. Right, so many people don't realize that this document's a massive forgery. So it's still quoted and cited. Um, it's at Mizrahi Books. Uh, and the editor of this, who is a fine Talmud Chacham, his name is Ruve Namar, he uh, has a whole essay explaining why Shaul Berlin was one of the Gadol Yisrael. Meaning great, great rabbis of Israel. At, uh, the Bassami Rosh. He knows nothing about Shaul Berlin's history and how he uh, was in with the Hamaskilim. But that's, uh, he comes out firmly on the. So the Maskilim are the, those Jews in the 18th, 19th century who embrace secular learning. So you can be a Talmudic scholar and a Maskil. But generally speaking, those who embrace secular learning are not so learned in Torah. Those who embrace Torah are learning. Not so secularly learned. On the side of uh, Shaul Berlin, uh, he sees them as falsely persecuted. Now, in the back of the book, this new edition, you have his notes. Many. So it's kind of hard to imagine that these very smart people didn't recognize that this was a massive forgery. Right? But uh, a lot of people are book smart, but uh, not particularly wise to the ways of the world. Many, many pages. 75 pages of notes, which are very helpful, because he, he, he calls attention to a lot of strange ideas there, and then tries to justify it, and he helps us understand some of the stuff that's going on there. Uh, the book has the Haskama of Meaning approval. Yosef. Now, Ravavad Yosef, he knows that the sun and Rosh is forged, and he... So the uh, Yosef is probably the greatest 
Sephardic rabbi of the 20th century. He writes about it in the Omer, but he says that just like with the book of Ben Sira, the uh, Talmud says that you can take what's good in it. He, he says if there's a good star in the Besai Rav. So I remember going to see Avadya Yosef speak and has a reputation of being such a brilliant man. <laughs> My reaction was, if he's so brilliant, why can't he speak English? <laughs> but Avadya Yosef is one of those rare, great rabbis who also had a touch for the common man. Like uh, soccer teams would come visit him before an important game. He liked uh, Egyptian music, man of the people and a tremendous Torah scholar and savvy political operator. You can take it, not because of Shaul Berlin, you're not relying on his authority, but if he makes a good suggestion and how to read a text, uh, uh, you can use it. Uh, but you're not relying on the books per se. And as I said, there's a big debate among the post not among the economic scholars. Did he forge the entire uh, volume? Yeah. So, big forger, kind of a very weird, disturbing dude. And what's even more disturbing, the number of people who speak up for it. 